Welcome to Ascend TV and Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host for today, Camilla Bixler, and... And I'm Will Burnick. And today we have a special guest, Dr. Maureen Dunn, who's going to be joining us from Chicago. But before we talk to her, Will, show us your sweater and tell us what's going on. For, for my first shirt of, of the year, is um, my first shirt of the year is my is my Harry Potter, is my Gryffindor sweater. It, it, was, a, it was a Hanukkah present, and... It, it represents, and it's it's from Gryffindor. It rep it represents Gryffindor House from Hogwarts, also Harry's house in the series, and the ma the the main or sh or should I say the hero's house. All 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 the good guys are in Gryffindor. Okay, Will, would you like to sit down now and begin the questioning? Maureen, can you tell us about your background? Sure. Yeah. So first, uh, really really excited to be here. Um, I've been part of the neurodiversity community and working um, in the field for over 20 years. Um, I've had a number of, of different roles. I, I started my career more as a researcher and completed my um, PhD at, at Oxford in, in the cognitive sciences, but I've, I also have, have spent many years doing a lot of advocacy work. Most recently, I've been I'm the former president of the Illinois Community College Trustees Association and helped pass some legislation in my state to make college campuses more neurodiversity friendly. And I'm the author of an upcoming book uh, that we're going to talk about. Can you tell us how you came to be involved in the autism community? Yeah, um, so it, I, I first um, became really involved as a teenager, and I was working um, with children, connecting with um, autistic children, and had some really powerful experiences um, as a teenager. And then, you know, in my twenties, um, I was simultaneously I was I was working. Um, on my PhD and really, you know, just experiences I had with many children led me to believe that there was just so much, so much we didn't understand and wanting, um, you know, to figure out better ways in which we could see aut the strengths um, of autism. And and then over time, we started to put together some pieces too, as I, as I was, um, um, I as a child, I was um, hyperlexic, so I was reading at three, and so I I think I think that there's just uh, there's a lot more um, there's a lot of people that don't fit one box really well in the community as as well. I think there's a lot of complexity. Um, so, but that but my, but the, my first where I first got really interested and committed to the community was the work I was doing as a teenager. Can you tell us about your new book? Sure, I'd love to. Um, so the title's the Neurodiversity Edge, and I'd say um, just off the at the start, I'd just say like the one of the reoccurring themes is how neurodiversity is an asset, not a trade-off, and put a lot of emphasis on trying to get uh, especially organizational readers to uh, leaders, sorry, to understand that genuine inclusion is not this sort of tick the box strategy. And so, so the approach of the book is to try to get the reader to really have a genuine appreciation um, for the rich diversity um that comes along with with there's so with more representative um neurodiversity and um and we um i i, I start in chapter in the first chapter i um bring up uh you know a couple interesting stories and and research and and one thing a lot of people probably aren't that familiar with is um there's there's some research on um uh beehives that even you know a, a very community driven uh, type of species as bees, they there there's a cohort that's a, called like the divergent bees. There's like 20% of bees that don't follow this um, waggle dance. And so like 80% of bees follow what we call this, this waggle dance. And it helps um, the bee communities find uh, the closest sources of, of pollen. Um, but there's 20% that kind of just fly, it looks like they're flying off in random directions and not sort of doing things um, the typical way, but it actually turns out that that 20% of divergent bees um, are a huge, huge asset to the whole hive community because they account for a disproportionate um, uh, amount of, of innovation in terms of discovering new sources of pollen that the whole community, where the whole community benefits and thrives. So there's also um so it goes beyond sort of uh 
book that's just about like neurodiversity at work. It, it's 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 really, I guess, on the on the broadest level, um, trying to promote um, what I would call authentic neurodiversity inclusion in our schools, in our communities, um, in the workplace, and uh, uncover some of the you know the reasons why. Um, there has been some barriers to that kind of inclusion, including um, a lot of cognitive biases and what we can all do to um, be better allies. So Maureen, congratulations on this important new book. Uh, it's very exciting to have it coming out right now. Um, we you. noticed that uh, your book is divided into three sections. And the first section is entitled, Why? Could you tell us about that section? Yeah. Um, so the uh, yeah, as you notice, there's the why, the what, and the how. And I think um, for the why, it's I, I realize that although we've um, there's a lot more awareness around our diversity, there's still a lot of people um, that aren't really familiar with it. And um, and there's again going back to some of the cognitive biases that people aren't even aware of. Uh, where maybe they make snap judgments based on like the one or two autistic people they've they've met. Um, I I I tried to um, really art you know I wanted to to articulate a vision for how crucial it is um, for everyone that we get this right. You know that we don't just you know check the box and pat ourselves on the back and say okay we've hired you know to neurodivergent people, but but that you know, regardless of your role, whether you're the CEO or um, you're not in a leadership position, you're always in a position to influence, um, a, you know, whatever whatever group of, of uh, uh, you're a part of, right? So it doesn't have to even just be companies, or organizations, but trying to, trying to really reinforce um, a strength-based perspective of neurodiversity, going through some of the research too of like how um, you know, we've traditionally, at least uh, uh, the a lot of the experts have traditionally focused maybe on more on deficits and trying to see um, see neurodiversity from a strength based lens. And I also talk about um, uh, the perils of groupthink. There's a lot of really interesting research about how, um, especially autistic people, are less prone to some of these same same cognitive biases and um, make more rational, consistent rational decisions and how um, that's a, a really big asset, like even to boards, right? Being on a board of directors where there tends, sometimes there tends to be, or can be, I should say, not not all the time, but um, can be a risk of, of groupthink. And, um, you know, the the value of just how how in inherently valuable it is to, to always be including um, neurodivergent voices, people with lived experiences, and then being a cognitive scientist, that's my background, um, you know, going deeper into some of the unique and uncommon skills too as well that can go hand in hand with um, different types of uh, neurodivergent typologies. And, and the book, the book is, goes be, it's, you know, there's, there's a, a focus on autism, but there's um, I did talk a lot about ADHD and dyslexia and synthesia and and you know as we all know too there's there's a lot more overlap right um, hyperlexia synthesia there's a lot of more overlap than um, an ADHD years um, that are would also have autism so ADHD years you know so trying to introduce also the nuances the complexity the richness the diversity of the, of our community um, and and try to combat some of those stereotypes. Um, and really get into the, the different um, reasons why, if you are, you know, an organizational leader, that this should be a priority. And you said that okay. the second part uh, is entitled what? Yeah. So, um, so I, I think the the approach I I'm, I, I take <laughs> again, sort of uh, getting away from this tick the box approach is more of like a values driven approach. Like, what does that look like in practice? And um, you know, I have a, a framework that I offer called the Pyramid of Neuroinclusion, and I bring up a number of case studies, both um, from CEOs, organizational leaders, um, and uh, a lot of, of people with lived experiences. Um, some are autistic, some that um, have uh, are ADHD, have ADHD or, or dyslexia, um, 
And um, the idea of the pyramid of um, neuroinclusion, it's something I uh, started out working on when I was at University of Chicago many, many years ago. And I was studying under someone who had actually studied under Abraham Mas Maslow. And it was broader at the time. I was thinking of it more in terms of like broader social inclusion and community inclusion. Um, and I still think about it that way. Say, you know, even my book, I think, you know, there's, I'm, I'm working with like clubs like Rotary, you know, so I see it as broader than just uh, an employment, um, more just about authentic inclusion. But I think that it's, um, uh, it's really valuable for employers who may be um, starting the process of becoming more neurodivergent friendly. And I've worked with um, a number of companies that, you know, where, where, they seemed on the surface to be doing some good work and making progress. And, you know, there's a sensory friendly policy in, in place and there's good things happening, but then some of sometimes, and this isn't of course, of course always the case, but there's some case studies where uh, it was really like things, there was, there was neurodiversity, neurodivergent friendly policies happening on the surface, but um, under the surface, it was still a pretty toxic organizational culture where there was a lot of bullying happening, um, a lot of, of gossiping, just very uh, unhealthy environment um, for for anyone, right? Um, but uh, uh, so I, so the pyramid, it's that's that's one of, just for, based on these years of research and experience. I put psychological safety and trust and um, direct communication as being like the bedrock of a healthy organizational culture because I feel like even though there's 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 every level of this pyramid is extremely important to um achieving that goal of authentic inclusion that you know you could have you could have some policies but if 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 they're if it's if um if there's yeah if there's an unhealthy culture where bullying is allowed and um uh there isn't true psychological safety then it you know it, to me it will it wouldn't matter how many other pieces that you were doing right because that would just be a super unhealthy culture where nobody can thrive right um and there's a lot of there's a lot of research also about connecting um psychological safety to the most innovative teams um you know the types the types of teams where there isn't a lot of fear you know and and it's rewarded to be able to if you're different and you bring up a new idea or something that other people you know, even managers or leaders haven't um, been advocating for. And so I, I, in the, what I go, you know, again, sort of reinforce these, um, that, that pyramid. And then I also uh, talk about um, something called the three C's, which is uh, codification um, and conduct drives culture. And so uh, bring up about, you know, because I've helped some organizations codify some new policies, but again, if in practice, if what's allowed in in a organizational culture is not consistent with those policies, um, that's going to drive again an unhealthy culture. So, like the degree to which there's integrity between those two um, is is what's going to drive the strongest, um, healthiest culture. Where I think everyone, you know, it can thrive in cognitive differences. It could be genuinely appreciated and valued. So. The what is, um, it's not a tick the box approach. It's, I think I call it, um, I say it's not uh, uh, cosmetic um, surgery, but this is gene therapy that um, we need to get this right at the, the DNA level of organizational culture. And that's where you see the most benefit in terms of, um, of, 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 of uh, neurodivergent people feeling like they really can belong and then you're going to see um, you're going to get the most out of all of your um, employees. And and then the other two uh, or two, two other points I bring up in the what is um, uh, I kind of, you know, take an, take a make an argument against cultural fit, because I think that that's, you know, a lot in many cases, especially for larger companies, has been sort of a shorthand of let's just hire more people that think like us. And um, and instead, you know, talk about the importance of of neurodiversifying your um, human resources uh, portfolio and making sure that everyone um, has uh, uh, can can genuinely 
belong, right? Which is different than being forced to fit in. Um, and then, you know, uh, the other one is just, we talked a little bit about it earlier, was, is just expose some of the cognitive, unconscious cognitive biases that sometimes prevent um, authentic inclusion. And just the more that we can all become aware um, of those, the the more, you know, likely we're going to be able to combat them. I, I think I called it an, an invisible um, species of cockroach, you know, because they're, they're hard, <laughs> they're hard to... Uh, to to grasp and understand um but they really impede um i think um uh successful inclusion and authentic inclusion for neurodivergent people you know i would like to ask you and i don't know if you have any examples at hand of a company or an organization that has done it right and that has all yeah done. yeah it's a good i mean so so a lot of the Case studies. Some throw. I had I worked with a lot of um, middle level companies, and 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 uh, there's a number of scale ups, and some of them were large companies. Um, but I would say the ones that I think we're making a lot of progress. Um, you know, but I, I'd say the ones that are trying to do it right. I don't know if I would name a specific company, but I'd say there is a group of companies that have committed to this much deeper, long term approach. They're not just trying to create this special, uh, essentially this special pathway for neurodiversity employment. They're trying to, they know it's going to be more time consuming and more of an investment, but that it's worth it um, to to build uh, an organizational culture where everyone can belong. And so it's just, it's, it's a long, it's a, it's a different focus. It ends up being a different focus. So I, to me, the ones that are doing it right um, buy into that uh, you know, that that it's not just about, okay, we're going to show the world that we've hired X number of neurodivergent people, but we're actually committed to making sure our culture, our organizational culture can, um, can be such that all people, including neurodivergent people, can really truly thrive. And so that's a, it's a, it's a bigger commitment. Um, and in some of the things that I think um, have been effective is when, especially when um, the senior leaders really, truly buy in mm -hmm. and um, it's, it, it, there's some overlap with some of the work I've been doing in community colleges. I, um, I'd mentioned I spearheads in this legislation, but before that legislation, it started out by um, this education institution, the Illinois Community College Trustees Association, all the representatives across the state um, voted to approve uh, just our organization having um, the first adopting the first neurodiverse uh, neurodiversity inclusion values statement and and you know there were some people who said oh it's just a value statement you know may, is that really going to change anything and what's been really interesting to watch is um, how uh, once 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 we at the state level passed. Um, uh, that value statement for our organization, and then it turned into to some state legislation later. Um, that then colleges around the country have been adopting that statement at the at, at the board of trustees meeting, so at the board level, and then the cabinets have been, um, you know, issuing um, their own statements, like the president and leadership. And then I've seen that kind of open the door to have deeper conversations throughout the organization of, oh, well, maybe we could do, maybe we should be thinking about this differently. Maybe we could be doing more. Maybe how we've been doing things isn't, um, maybe there's a better way to do things. And then, and so I've actually seen something as simple as these value statements um, when leadership really truly buys in, then, you know, it'd be really effective as a starting point, you know, in and of itself, it wouldn't be effective, but as a starting point where then an entire organization then starts having conversations about like, okay, could maybe we, we could do a sensory friendly um, room, you know, what, what are we missing here? What more um, could we be doing? And so I think, I think um, that, you know, companies that where there is buy-in at the leadership level and it's the you know on a daily basis the CEO and the board they um, they live and breathe the values that they espouse um, in that statement you know there's that consistency where they're telling positive stories about neurodivergent people and there's these different conversations happening that weren't being I think that pleases me that's really been exciting to see that progress 
Um, Because I think that's one of the hardest things to change is to change how people think and um, to not be so like focused on the deficits, but see, but see the strengths and have these, these conversations that are really going to help people um, develop their full potential. And so I don't know if I'd name like one company, I would just say as a strategy, the ones that I feel are doing this right, like they really, truly, genuinely buy in and see, you know, the importance of talking differently about it, about leadership getting really actively involved and changing the kinds of conversations that are are happening throughout an organization. Great. Stacy, do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering what the DEI equation was. Would you be willing to go into detail about that? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I actually wrote an article back in 2020 um, for American Diversity Report explicitly saying like, you know, why is neurodiversity not explicitly part of uh, the DEI framework? Because um, I, I think it 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 should be for sure. And um, uh, I think um, there's been some progress in, in in that regard. I guess to you know in, in in some states anyway. In in my book, I do raise some of these questions of how is this not. Um, been you know explicitly part of the D- DEI framework um because it clearly fits in we have uh, across the whole neurodiversion umbrella i think what 20 you know 30 to 40 percent um unemployment rate obviously a lot higher just in the autistic community um and so many people that have like you know skill sets that um where I mean, it just it, it's it's really I think uh, it's 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 really a failure of, of human capital that there are so many people in our community that are unemployed. I think I'm I'm an advocate for this being for sure part of DEI and and just a lot of the things I've seen myself and just so many stories of when going back to like you know the unconscious biases like that also that also means you know um, like this there's so much more that we could be doing to try to um, break some of these stereotypes, showcase so much, so much, so many, so many skills that um, so many skilled people that should uh, be given the support that they need to succeed. And now we're going to go to Jennifer Brooks and her book review. Oh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Life on the Autism Spectrum Book Report. I am Jennifer Brooks, your book correspondent, and today I'm going to tell you about three books that feature the family of the actress Holly Robinson Pete. She has four children. The oldest two are twins, a boy and a girl, and the boy is on the autism spectrum and Holly Robinson Pete and her two oldest children have collaborated to write three books about their family life with a family member on the autism spectrum. The first two are picture books. First one to be written is called My Brother Charlie. This book was featured on the list of uh, disability in children's books that was published by the Oakland Public Library. And this book is told from the perspective of the oldest daughter, who is the twin sister of the boy with autism. He's called Charlie in the book, but his real name is RJ. The second book is called Charlie makes a splash. Well, the first book is told from the point of view of RJ's sister. This is the book where Charlie gets to tell his own story, especially about how much he loves splashing in water. The title, not just a metaphor. Charlie slash RJ says, when you're a kid like me, you feel the world in special ways. Water settles me down, opens me up, takes me to places only I can touch. Making a Splash Sets Me Free. And the third book is for older readers from uh, 
elem elementary and middle school age called same but in a different teen life on the autism express now this is about the uh high school experience of rj and ryan ryan the girl is a sophomore rj was held back a year so he's only a freshman in high school even though the twins are the same age. And yeah, this is the kind of book that English teachers should absolutely love because it really hammers the point about how different people can have different perspectives on the same situation. The book alternates between Ryan and RJ, called in the book Callie and Charlie, and their descriptions of certain incidents and charlie repeatedly says things like you know he doesn't understand what he's doing wrong or what's wrong with the picture and callie then comes in and she writes about how you know i love my brother i really want to protect him from being bullied and being taken advantage of but he's 15 years old and stop acting like his mother and let him fight his own battles but at the same time, I don't want to see him get hurt. So what should I do? Talking about wanting to yell at Charlie, don't do that because it's embarrassing. It annoys people. It makes you look weird. But poor Charlie has no idea that that's how he is directing himself to other people, which is a very common problem for those of us on the spectrum. Stacy, do you have a cultural report for us? Hello, everybody. Today, I will be sharing... First thing, Wednesday, February 14th, um, should have worn red. <laughs> anyway, there's going to be a dinner show taking place on Powell Street in San Francisco um, at the Paca Pachamama. It'll start at 7.30 PST, $55 to $59. And it'll be a night, of course, of celebrating uh, two-time Latin Grammy nominee, Eddie Navia, uh, Quentin Navia, and the Pachamama Latin Band. All prepared, all prepaid uh, tickets, including the three-course organic dinner choices of entrees and the live Latin music and dancing. And Saturday, February 17th, will be a Ascend's next uh, Park and Lagoon walk, um, where we will be meeting at the Marina Green, which is um, near the corner of Marina Boulevard and Scott Street, um, where you see a great view of the Golden Gate Bridge. And Phil's Coffee, there will be a truck of Phil's Coffee right there. And that's another ideal spot to be meeting there. The meeting will start at 11 a.m. Keep checking the Ascend website as usual. And including that will be Marina Green to Aquatic Park and a loop around the Palace of Fine Arts. Saturday, March 9th at 2 p.m. is at the Davies Symphony Hall, SFASA. Go to the symphony for free, and it's music for families, and there's dance and the service fee of $5 per ticket. Very limited supplies. Registrations will be in, emailed before the event, and if uh, SFASA's tickets sell out, you could still purchase um, at the standard rate at SF Symphony website of sfsymphony.org. So buy tickets, um, I'd say as soon as possible, it seems, and choose sections FF, about six, about adult tickets cost about $36. So thank you for joining us for this episode of Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Camilla Bixler, co-host. I'm Will Burnick, all, another co-host. I'm Stacey Kennedy, the cultural uh, correspondent. I'm Jennifer Brooks, your book reviewer. And I'm Maureen Dunn, the author of The Nerd Over Sea Edge. To everyone, and we hope that you can join us next time.